Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. Life is uncertain. It's okay to feel stressed, anxious, worried, or frustrated. CalHOPE can help. Access CalHOPE's free and secure mental health resources. Call 833-317-4673 or live chat at CalHOPE.org. Hi, it's Patrick O'Driscoll here. You might know me as Pods. I'd like to welcome you to the Adelaide Hills Farmcast. It's the podcast we produce for the love of farming right throughout the Adelaide Hills region. And now, I'll hand over to Adelaide Hills Farm Services' very own Belle Baker. Over to you, Belle. Thanks, Pods. Hello and welcome to this month's Adelaide Hills Farmcast. Today we're recording at Sandy Gunter's property near Woodside. Sandy and husband Joe have been here for 10 years when the Cudley Creek fire ripped through their property. Hi Sandy. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for hosting us today. You're welcome. Sandy and I are going to have a chat a bit later on about the impact of the Cudley Creek fires on their property and what it means to have finally had the last of their damaged infrastructure replaced. But initially, I'm going to list a few things on the Adelaide Hills Farm Services farm calendar to see what small acreage or lifestyle farmers and property owners could be thinking about during June. If you're new to the Adelaide Hills Farmcast, we've divided our farm calendar into different sections to cover the main land uses in the hills. I do take liberties with with this each month, keeping the information relevant and practical. Uh, If there's any particular information that you're looking for, please let me know. I'm always keen to help and welcome your feedback. Everything I'm about to discuss can be found in the show notes for this episode in your podcast player or on our website, adelaidehillsfarmservices.com.au. Let's dig in and see what we find. (coughs) Right, we'll start off with livestock. Early June is a good time for calf or lamb marking. Of course, this will depend on when your calves or lambs were born. If you're relatively inexperienced and only have to mark a handful of stock every year, then the smaller the animal, the easier it's going to be for you. Any time when the animal is over approximately three weeks is good. Any earlier and there's a risk of mismothering. You've got some stock here, you've got cattle? Yes, yeah. we have Scottish Highland cows. Nice, nice. And uh, have you done any calf marking or are they, where uh, are they at? Yes, so we used to breed yes. and we currently have one calf on the ground. Nice. But my cows are quite aged now. Right. Um, and when we put the bull in, we've only had one ah. of the cows conceive right so um, and that doesn't bother you or you're going to doesn't bother us because we're not commercial no we grow we raise beef mm. so we slaughter these animals but mm. we raise them for family and friends yes nice. uh, so for me it's all about knowing the provenance of my meat how it's been mm. treated um, if it's been handled ethically, all of those kinds of things. Yeah, a happy right. cow is a good meal. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, that's good, that's good. I've found a really informative and easy to read guide on castrating beef cattle by the Condinum Group, and I've put a link to it in the show notes. Because you'll have all your cows and calves or sheep and lambs in the yards uh, to do any calf or lamb marking, it's generally combined with other health checks and things we do with stock. So one of them is administering a B12 injection the other is a five-in-one vaccination for your lambs. We generally do dehorning or debutting. I'm guessing you don't do dehorning. No, we like our yeah. cattle to have their horns. Yeah. It's part of their character. It is. Yeah. Although it is a consideration for people if they are choosing to produce a number of animals, because yes. many abattoirs do not like horned animals that's anymore. That's right. That's right. They cause something called dark cutters, and that is. Uh, not something that the industry likes. But of course, dehorning or debutting is only relevant for horned breeds. And to be honest, most of the breeds of cattle that we see frequently in the Adelaide Hills are a naturally polled animal like the Murray Gray, Angus, uh, what's the other one? Dexters. Dexters for small holders. Yep, yep, and the Belted Galloway. Yep. Funny story. Uh, Yesterday, we went out and did some calf marking on a property that had black scimitars. Um, which was great. It was just so good to be back in the yards. But uh, th- they are a horned animal, but uh, these ones, there didn't seem to be any need to be doing any um, dehorning, which was, which was good. Anyway, I digress. The other thing to do while you've got your stock in the yards is a backline parasitic spray for the control of internal and external parasites. Now, we would suggest it's only necessary to do that with your cows, not to do the calves that are actually 
on their mothers still because they will get that protection through their mother's milk. So it does save you money because a good quality parasitical spray does, it can be quite expensive and we want to make sure your dollars count. The other thing we do of course is tagging with the NLIS tags and any of your own property recording system tags, things that you have. Do you do, you do that here? Yes, so we only do some of those things. We run a very small number yes. of animals, yep. so we backline if they look like they need it, yes. but to reduce the worm burden, we rotate our animals through our paddocks yes, quite good. frequently. Yes. Not only is that kinder to the pasture, but it's making sure that animals aren't hanging around on worm burdened pastures. Yeah, that's absolutely. So last month we talked a lot about that and it's really good to hear, you know, people on small acreage actually doing that and take, you know, putting it into practice. So yeah, that sounds great. So it becomes quite an efficient process, you know, if you're going to the effort to put your stock in the yards, um, whether they're sheep or cattle, you can get quite a lot done once the mob is in the yards, rather than sort of getting them in and maybe doing the calf marking and then getting them in later. Uh, if you're time poor, then to do it all at once is a really good idea. Of course, working safely in your yards for both you and your stock is paramount. Lucky, I'm guessing, Sandy, you listened to our March Farmcast and did some of the routine maintenance of your yards. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, go on. <laughs> laugh out loud so people know you're actually laughing at me. Um, so I did talk about um, Maintenance March, which, uh, and actually, um, in hindsight, I didn't actually put in there to maintain your tagging equipment uh, and, and your uh, spray equipment, etc. But that would be a really good thing to have actually looked at and maintained, cleaned, um, in preparation for calf marking etc so I will in hindsight add that to the list of things we do in maintenance march. Now if you're not confident to mark your bull calves or ram lambs it's not a bad idea to work in with a neighbour or engage a contractor. There are a few around the Adelaide Hills who can help. A call out on one of the local chat groups uh, through your socials should give you a list of who you can call. Moving on to productive gardens. Now you've got quite a wonderful garden out here, Sandy. You've got quite a bit going on. I, do I see, are there, straw, are there strawberries? Uh, in the cages, raspberries. Raspberries, I yep. I do have a few strawberries in hanging baskets yep. because my chickens love them. Right, <laughs> that is really interesting. Tell me why your raspberries are in a cage. Uh, because the blackbirds love them. Ah, right. So um, they're in a cage with Small gauge chicken wire, yes. it still allows the wrens and finches to get in there and yes. eat the aphids or any yes. little bugs, yes. but it keeps the blackbirds, who are thieves, yes. out. Excellent, excellent, very good. Well, that is, I'm fascinated that you're doing your strawberries in hanging baskets because that's what I'm about to do. So this month, I'm planting strawberries for the first time ever, and it's also a good time to plant rhubarb and globe artichokes. Now, I have to admit, I am going to be doing, putting my strawberries in hanging baskets, but not for the same reason as you. I'm putting them in hanging baskets because we still have a problem with rabbits. Oh. And anyone who's listened to this farm cast before knows that I have a little bit of a problem with, with rabbits at home and they are my absolute nemesis. And uh, height is going to be my main defence, so very similar to uh, solving your problem with the chickens. Now, I was going to just plonk the strawberry seedlings into a good potting mix, sprinkle around some water and wish them good luck. But then I thought I'd do a bit of research first, having never actually planted strawberries before. Uh, and I'm glad I did. Growing strawberries seems to be a lot trickier than I could ever have imagined. So if you're like me and new to growing strawberries, here's a few tips and facts that may help you. I, perhaps I should be asking Sandy this instead of uh, the research that I've done. So, Sandy, you probably know all this. Strawberries need to be planted in a slightly acidic soil with a pH between 5.5 and 7. I didn't know that. Uh, they need heaps and heaps of good compost, worm castings or poo manure, but whatever you do, don't use mushroom compost or any chicken poo. Is that right? Is that yes, because yes? they're yep. alkaline in nature. That's right, yes. So if you're planting strawberry runners rather than seedlings, here's where I couldn't believe how technical it could possibly get. You're supposed to dig out quite a large hole and then mound some dirt in the middle of the hole, remove any dead or old roots um, of your strawberry runners, Leave nice bright white roots around the crown. Put the crown on the mould and arrange the roots down and around the crown. Then it's time to backfill the hole and water it in. And that's where I'd sort of give it a, you know, a bit of good luck wish too. Now having done this research and going into a cold sweat, I decided to delay my plans for planting strawberries. But uh, with fresh optimism, 
Uh, the next day I realised that it's probably how commercial strawberries are planted, so I'm going to have to be really brave and start planting this weekend. Uh, is that what you do? Yeah, look, uh, I was a little taken aback when yeah. you started listening all that, Yeah, because that is not what I did. Really? No. no. I grew you mine, just went plonk? I grew mine from runners and I just went plonk. I did water them with a seaweed solution right. afterwards because that's really good for helping plants settle in and yes. avoid or reducing transplant shock. Right. Um, so that's a little tip for yep. home growers that might help them, but I certainly didn't follow all no. of those instructions. Right, yeah. And this is not your first regalia. You've done you've planted strawberries before with success. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Not in commercial quantities. No. No. We have a strawberry farm just down the road. We do. We do. And I'm actually uh, put a call in to go and see them to perhaps get you know I'm thinking I might catch up with them and perhaps get them to help me plant my strawberries. Yeah, well right. they've That's, been doing it for a very long time. Haven't they? And they do a wonderful uh, job there at uh, Green Valley Strawberries. Ratio. So once all that dirty work's done, they say, they say being all my research online, a thick layer of mulch followed by a layer of fresh straw between the plants to prevent fungal disease and prevent weeds. And then of course it's time to finally sprinkle around some water and you're saying sea salt and to wish them luck. And boy, will they need that in my garden. So yes, I like a good challenge. So I'm going to record the strawberry planting efforts and their progress and I'll keep it updated on the socials. I may live to regret that. Don't hold me to it. <laughs> I'll see how I go. So then our attention turns to pastures. And in June in the Adelaide Hills, uh, that's when we do our post-emergent spray programs. Uh, a post-emergent spray program is simply a follicular application of herbicide after the target weeds have emerged from the soil. The timing, rate of chemical and chemical selection is all dependent upon so many factors, including the weather, environmental conditions, species of crop, pastures to be sprayed, size of the weeds present together with the species of weeds present. There's quite a bit to it. We've accumulated this agronomic knowledge over a lifetime of farming, farming, but if you're unsure, please reach out to farming contractors like Adelaide Hills Farm Services or contact your local resellers. In this month's interview with Pods, David Evans touches on the importance of undertaking a ChemCert course. This short one-day course is now available online and it's the ideal course for small acreage or lifestyle property owners wanting more information and that peace of mind that comes with knowing about the chemicals you use on your property. Have you or Joe done a ChemCert? No, uh, I have in a very long time ago. Yeah, and I don't think it's important to keep it up to date. I think one of the things is just to do it to get that base knowledge. If yeah. you're not doing spraying commercially, hugely amount. Yeah, yeah. and I think more so than understanding... Uh, so Kemsert covers everything from yes. way to go, and, f and my partner Jay hasn't done that. But no. for me, the most important stuff is understanding the safety aspects. Yes, absolutely. So making sure that you're wearing gloves, goggles, masks mm. if you need to and actually I advocate wearing those things even with supposedly low to or, or, oh, or safe chemicals yes. because you can never be too sure. No absolutely and you don't know how your body is going to react with those chemicals. Exactly. I think one of the really important things with the ChemCert qualification or course I guess is the better mm. word is that it helps you understand what you're reading on the back of the label of your chemical because that is can be gibberish if you're new to it. So uh, having that ability, you know, somebody there teaching you how to break it all down is great. And I, I know there is an online course now, but I just don't think you get that level of input from other people around and the people who really know uh, about these things if you do it online. But it is a good solution if you're time poor, but I would be advocating to, to actually go to the one day course. There is one in Murraybridge quite frequently, and I think there's one in Adelaide as well. Mm -hmm. What I have done is I've included a link to the ChemSearch course that we put our employees through. I've put that in the show notes. Uh, so there are a few, and if I find another uh, contract or supplier that does that, I will put that in as well. So hopefully that will give you a few ideas of what we could be thinking about and planning to do on your property in June. I'll be back next month with more timely jobs and advice and to give you a bit of a to-do list for July. And don't forget, all the notes are in the show notes for this episode at adelaidehillsfarmservices.com.au. Before I chat with Sandy, Pod's caught up with David Evans from Farmers Business Network this week. David is an account executive with Farmers Business Network and has had a significant amount of influence and experience in the agricultural industry in South Australia. 
we thought he would be the perfect person to talk about chemical safety and how to undertake a post-emergent spray. Hi there and welcome to this month's episode of the Adelaide Hills Farmcast and with me this afternoon I've got the great David Evans now working for the Farmers Business Network. Good afternoon to you David. Good afternoon Pods and great to be here with you. Thank you very much for your time. Now currently working with the Farmers Business Network. Tell us a little bit about that and what is your role entail with the Farmers Business Network? Uh, so I'm currently the Account Executive for South Australia. Um, Farmers Business Network is a, a new concept. Uh, it's uh, basically a, uh, an online uh, store for farm inputs. So it started in America about uh, eight years ago, been in Australia for a couple of years. And um, it's, uh, I guess, making uh, ordering inputs, pricing inputs and all that sort of thing easier and quicker for farmers in that they can order from a 24-7 store uh, online or via an app on their phone. That sounds very exciting, mate, and atypical of uh, times are always changing and with the advantage of our modern day technology, cutting the need to some degree of relying on your reseller who quite often is only open on a uh, Monday to Friday basis from 7 till 5, 7 till 6, whatever it be. Yeah, that's right. And, and you know, we've already had quite a lot of positive feedback from people, particularly during seeding, who've been, uh, you know, checking prices and, and looking at various uh, crop protection products on their phone whilst they're up and going up and down on the tractor. As long as they're not hitting stoby poles, fences or anything of the <laughs> exactly. like whilst they're uh, engaging the GPS. And your background in agriculture, David? Oh, I've spent a whole lifetime working in agriculture and agribusiness. I, I came off a family farm, so I've had a, a background in farm management uh, from a you know, practical hands-on point of view. Um, but also been involved in various other agribusinesses and the livestock agency business uh, uh, in grain accumulation and, and marketing and uh, most recently in ag policy and advocacy prior to this role. Quite an extensive uh, career in agriculture, mainly based here in South Australia. Pretty but, much, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, excellent. Now, what we're talking about today, ladies and gentlemen, is post-emergent spraying. It is the month of June working on the theory that the majority of your crops and pastures have been sown and or have uh, germinated, being a naturally germinating perennial. And now's the time to be looking out at your crops and or pastures to see what nasties we have in terms of uh, any insects and diseases and weed uh, population. What does post-emergent spraying mean to you, David? Well, as the, as the term uh, implies, pods, I guess it's, it's basically looking to control any weeds uh, within your crop and pasture that may have germinated uh, either at the same time as the crop or or since then. So basically anything that you, did, you didn't pick up um, you know, prior to seeding. Yes, okay, excellent. And uh, what should we be looking for? What would you recommend people do in terms of looking at their crops and pastures and then making a decision on what type of controls they need to uh, undertake? Uh, just a little bit of help with the decision making, albeit I fully understand that everyone's farm, crop and pasture is different and there's not a one size fits all. No, that's that's absolutely right, but there are some, some common uh, themes I suppose and I, I guess the first one is just to be out and about having a look in the in the crop or pasture and seeing what's actually happening, being able to identify uh, sort of weeds and undesirable plants that you don't want there, uh, and just noting at what growth stage they are relative uh, relative to the to the crop, um, because obviously you want them to have a little bit of growth about them before you start applying applying chemicals. Uh, they'll take it up much more readily. Absolutely, there's a, uh, a few. <laughs> pretty concrete messages I think everyone needs to understand and please correct me if I'm wrong or uh, make any comment as I go here but basically we have to understand when we make in the decision making process of applying a herbicide, a fungicide, 
or to a lesser extent a fungicide or an insecticide. We need to understand the growth stage of the plant or the desirable crop yep. or pasture that we're talking about and also we need to understand the growth stage of the weed in particular. One of the real key uh, drivers that every agronomist uh, and, and crop production specialist will tell you will be the smaller the plant, smaller the weed is, uh, the cheaper it is to control. Now that's all well and good and I fully support that but it has to be understood that you can only do so much in given time frames uh, from an operational sense. Yeah and the other thing about that two pods is that you know uh, unlike using a non-selective chemical you know early in the season once you're in the in crop situation you're going to be using a, a, a selective chemical and so not every chemical or, or, or no one chemical is going to remove all the weeds that, do, that you want to uh, get rid of at once. That's a good point and I guess we've got to understand what the difference is between a knockdown chemical and a selective and pretty much the time has passed for our knockdown chemicals unless we're doing a spring sowing of a crop or a pasture. Yeah, that's right. But now we're talking about selectives with our herbicides. Can, do you want to define what a selective is? I, I guess uh, a selective, as the name implies, is a chemical that's specifically developed to be active on one particular plant species whilst leaving others untouched. So, you know, you can have a grass selective herbicide which basically kills grasses, uh, or broadleaf herbicide which is targeting broadleaves and will leave grasses and things alone. So it's a matter of working out what your issue is and then selecting the appropriate tools for the job. Excellent answer. Now, what about take home messages with the act of spraying? Once we've made a decision that yes, we do need to apply a herbicide, an insecticide, a fungicide for uh, pest, and control, uh, pest and disease control or weed control, what type of uh, messages would you like to put out there to the viewing world on our podcast that they should understand when applying a chemical? I think I think the most basic and most obvious one, and it's often the one that people forget the more familiar they get with spraying, uh, is just read the label. You know, know exactly what it is that you're trying to achieve and then read the label. I mean, there's a, there's a huge amount of research and development trial work, all that sort of stuff goes into producing modern day agricultural chemicals and so if it says something on the label about you know do not do this or spray at this growth stage there's a really good reason for that and that's you know because that's what's been proven over time so uh, sounds obvious but I would just say read the label. It's an excellent point David and uh, I just can't ram that home enough because uh, Talking about weeds and the research that a lot of the multinational uh, companies do, together with some Australian-based uh, companies, this is a multi-million dollar, probably a billion dollar industry that we're talking about. Absolutely. And it is absolute big time dollars that a lot of these companies are spending in their own research and development and what does come out on the label is not only through their research and development but also also through different legislations for different countries Correct. and states and and so the other thing is to you know be aware of of uh, often on the label it'll say registered for control of xyz weed in new south wales and victoria but not in western australia for argument's sake so just be aware of where you are and and what legislation um, covers you um, from that point of view Okay, and David, what are the what's one of the real take-home messages that you'd like to put across when we do come to uh, uh, making a decision about spraying, how we go about the spraying, etc. And there's another old mate driving past. Uh, but yeah, what are your key take-home messages? Look, I think I think the first one's really obvious, and having made a decision as to which chemical that you're going to use for the job, um, the very obvious one is read the label. 
uh, and it's something that people often forget. So, you know, every drummer chemical that you buy should have a label on it. This one's got it neatly tucked in there. Um, there's a huge amount of R&D and uh, research and development goes into, into making chemicals these days, and so there's quite a detailed list of, you know, it tells you which situation, which weeds it will control, uh, what rate to use and then a few critical comments about uh, you know what situation you're using it in so you know just go and find the bit that applies to you find the find the weed that you're trying to target and pretty much everything you need to know is in there including you know tank mixtures and uh, if you if you're mixing chemicals together what order to mix them in and all that sort of stuff it's all in there. Um, and too often, you know, we have complaints from people who say, oh, I used this chemical and, you know, I wasn't happy with, with the result. And you go, well, did you do this or that? Oh, oh no. Well, it was actually on the label. So, And yeah. that label is a really key piece of information. And the other thing that I'd like to get across to a lot of our listeners with our podcast, David, is our national companies who are producing chemical and our international companies who are producing chemical we're not just talking millions of dollars that they put into their research and development they are putting in hundreds of millions of dollars oh, and almost going to the billions yep. of dollars yep. for their research and development and that is all they have to be seen to be doing the right thing they have to be responsible for the product that they use and all this is also legislated not only on a national basis but it's legislated on a state basis so yeah that's right just don't think that the research and development they're doing is to promote their own product and to uh, degenerate the opposition's product this is true research and development that is important for the most uh, effective and uh, efficient way to use their chemical in the crop and pasture situation exactly exactly um, I guess there's a couple of other things that you know you need to consider we've, we've, we've read the label um, probably the next most crucial thing is about timing um, and and the conditions when you're actually going to be spraying and so there's a, a couple of things to take it into consideration yeah look you know don't be spraying sort of early in the morning uh, or late at night if you can avoid it uh, avoid spraying in high windy conditions because when you think about it you're trying to put the droplets from your boom spray onto the target area and and ideally nowhere else um, so you know high winds are going to be an issue um, uh, you know, no wind isn't also an issue because you do need some wind to move droplets around a little bit. No wind's an interesting one, David. We all think the calmer the better, and I think on the whole that's generally right. But if you are reading pretty much zero kilometres an hour, and we're probably more so at the very end of the day, that can lead to some risk with off target damage. Yeah, exactly. And I think one of the other messages we try and put across with our farm cast here is to be a good neighbour. Off target damage where you're spraying and for instance no wind could end up being uh, chemical uh, delivered across the fence to your neighbour and inadvertently killing some of his desired plants, his or hers I should say and then all of a sudden there could be some questions asked and uh, the relationship between two neighbours can then be uh, yeah, tested. That's right, and, and look, pretty much no one wants to go there. Um, and, and I guess in the in the Adelaide Hills, that's one of those things that's it's probably magnified a bit because you've got a lot of smaller holdings and most people have multiple neighbours. And so, you know, that's just something to be really, really aware of to try and keep the chemical where it's meant to be and, and nowhere else. Um, one of the other things I was thinking about um, prior to this was um, particularly if you're going to engage a contractor, so not everyone's got all their own spraying gear and that's, and that's fine, it's often more cost effective and efficient to engage a contractor, um, but just have a bit of a look about the country that the contractor's going to be driving their vehicle or their spray unit across, particularly if, if crops and pastures have grown a little bit you know you can easily hide a log or a stone or a hole or anything like that as we look across the fence here um, you know that's just about perfect I would think you know most people you could drive a boom spray across that at 20 kilometers an hour without any fear of hitting anything um, so you know a few hours on the weekend or something spent cleaning up a bit of timber or filling in some holes picking up rocks that sort of thing will again make life easier for your contractor and ultimately cheaper for you 
great coal, David, and that's something I've learned in recent times that inadvertently, and this is part of our farm cast to try and make people aware of where they need to be, what they need to achieve, and, and like you said, I've, I've had instances where I've had to go around trees and branches, and you can see a lot of these limbs have been down for some time, and yeah, great Saturday afternoon project. Well, if, if nothing you know. else, firewood's 450 bucks a ton, so you may as well get out there with a chainsaw and, uh, and you know, clean it up, I think. Oh, it's a, it's a win-win for all concerned. It's a win for the contractor. It's a win for your good self and your uh, fire bucket on the Saturday night or any time in the hills. And just, yeah, it just makes it so much easier for all concerned. You get a better result. Less obstacles will lead to less areas where weeds can... Uh, penetrate and as you alluded to we've got a beautiful barley crop here just coming out of the ground I know this is a continuous crop paddock but it is almost billiard table like and agree totally with what you said you can uh, get over that at 20 kilometres an hour without a problem uh, good spray coverage good chemical application and uh, dead weeds that's it will be the result and that's what we're after correct yeah, I'd like to thank you again for your time. That's been most informative. Oh, it's my thank pleasure. Thank you very much for bringing us out here to this uh, lovely location. Uh, a late afternoon slash evening in very early June. All the best with your post-emergent selective spraying. Thanks very much, Pods. Thanks, Great David. to be with you. Good one. Cheers. Sandy, thank you for hosting us today. When Sandy and her husband Joe aren't riding horses or managing their property just out of Woodside in the Adelaide Hills, Sandy can be found working for Landscape SA or more specifically, what's your title? What do you do, Sandy? So I work for the Murraylands and Riverland Landscape that's Board it? in Communications and Community Engagement. Right. Wow, that's catchy. And how long have you been doing that for, Sandy? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is a big mouthful, that title. Ooh. I've been working for the Landscape Board since their inception, which has only just been recently. Yes, so, yeah. um, Was it like about two, uh, three, probably two years, two years, two two years, years or yeah. three years? Ah. But I've been working in this field for a very long time. Ah, okay. Um, so before that, I was working for the Natural Resource Management Boards, both here in the Murraylands and then uh, further north in the Arid Lands. Right. Wow. A wealth of knowledge. Right, so um, we're recording uh, this farm cast uh, in, your, in your house because it is raining outside, but I'm um, looking out under the pergola at these wonderful plants and, and uh, sort of an eclectic garden of uh, combined, like a garden that's combined with your vegetable garden and I can see your raspberries in their cage and it's beautiful out there. Everywhere I look, I can see evidence of the damage the Cudley Creek fires have done and there are some very encouraging rejuvenation. You were so fortunate that your house uh, wasn't burnt that day. Were, were you and Joe here? How did, did you? Uh, yeah. So yes, I was here mm -hmm. um, because it was a catastrophic day and I can, I can take the time off. Yes. I made sure that I was home. My partner is in emergency services and so he was actually working on the day. Right, right. Um, he's a police officer. Right, okay. So he was at the front line, but a different front line. Gosh, yes. Um, and so, yes, it was just a case of being prepared. Um, we were, weren't really expecting the fire to get this far, no, but we no. were prepared. And that's, that's, that's the key the to, to the saving yeah. everything. Yeah, excellent. Um, because your property is showing great signs of recovery. I mean, I don't think we've had opening rains. Would you say we've had season opening rains this year? Yes. No, no, I'm hoping this week. This week, week <laughs> yes. I agree. I need to run a bit of a poll, I think, and, you know, when uh, when we think we've, we're have we going to get or about, you know, or have had um, season opening rains. But um, other than infrastructure repairs, did you re-sow grasses and pastures to kick off the regrowth and handle the weeds? What did you do? Yeah, so... Interesting. I did remove all of my livestock except for my horses to give anything that grew a yes. chance. Yes. And I wasn't fussed about it being weeds. I just no. wanted soil cover. Yes, yes. Um, it was really important to get that. We've lost a lot of soil. Um, it's quite evident. You can see trees sitting on little islands. Oh, okay. Um, and you can see where we've lost soil down to um, the subsoil. 
uh, wow. because the organic matter within the soil burned. Burnt. Yes, yes. Um, so it was, yeah, cover was really important. So yes. that first 12 months, I actually didn't really do anything. No. Um, other than just let what would grow, grow. Mm -hmm. I originally was going to over sow, uh, but life just overtook us. Yes. And we didn't get the opportunity to put any seed no, in. No, no, no. I've since done that. Yes, uh, right, yes. In fact, this week. Oh, okay. <laughs> So that's fantastic to hear because that means you have just timed it beautifully with it. You are, you're patting yourself on the back, aren't you? Yes. You just think you're like, yep. Uh, and you've got a Cheshire yep. cat grin. Yeah, you have. You have. So you're not worried about post-emergent sprays just yet because, yeah, it's no. a bit early for you. Mm. And we, we actually, I'm more inclined to put less chemical on. So our, yes. our preparation has simply been to, we've done a broad broadleaf spray prior, to, so prior yep. to sowing. Um, because we have uh, quite a bit of cape weed has come yes, back after yeah. the fires. Um, but we haven't had too many nasty weeds. No. Uh, there's some blackberry that's come up and I've been trying to get on, keep on top of that. Yes. Um, but no other preparation for the oversight. So I must, I'll, I'll yeah. be clear, it's yeah. we're oversighting our existing yes. pastures. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what will come up will come yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, Because you're actually looking for grass pastures for, yeah, you're not actually growing it for a crop. No, my intention is to cut it for hay. So the what I've oversowed is a lot of perennial grass, yes. good hay making grass. But of course, we need to let that settle in and seed. Yes. So we won't be looking to make hay from it this year. No, no. Um, and we will only lightly graze it after it's come to head. Yes, excellent, very good. So you've stocked it back on here now. I mean, it, you mm -hmm. know, we are talking, is it 18 months ago now, I think, that the fires it, came through? It's actually more I than I mean, that. two and a half years. Yeah. Two and a half years. Yeah. Gosh, that's remarkable, isn't it? So, I mean, I imagine one of the first things to even get, you know, your horses uh, on here safely and, and then eventually your cattle was sort of to get your boundary fences and things done. Did you have Blaze Aid come and help you do um, your external boundary fences or did you get a private contractor how did that work for you um we didn't have blaze aid we were fortunate in that or fortunate or well organized yeah. or just lucky yeah. i'm not sure but basically straight after i got off of a fire hose mm. i got onto a phone and started ah. organizing a fencing contractor because yes. that was the as you say the first thing that we needed yeah. to do was to get our boundary fences rectified yes. we also had neighbors cattle here because we were one of the few pop properties that still had a functional bore ah uh, right um yes. and so on because you lost all your irrigation infrastructure as well yeah so all of our troughs and tanks run off of gravity feed yes and while the tank itself is concrete and withstood the fire air all the connections are plastic oh my gosh it's hard to fathom just what it takes to fully recover from a fire uh and, and you know i guess in a way i'm not I shouldn't be surprised that it's taken so long, but when we were here, we helped you out with some polven fencing. And that, that's how we met when you rang us and said, can you come and help us do this last bit of infrastructure? And you told us it was the last bit yes. of the puzzle to recover yep. from the fires. That is, you know, that gives me goosebumps. And it, it made, you know, we really felt like we'd contributed to something worthwhile um, and, and that what we do matters. But that's a really big long journey for you uh it was and we may have i yeah. may have jumped into it too soon right because certainly um joe had other things on his mind mm. in terms of just um having there was a lot of follow-up obviously being a police officer yes. that he had to do and he was also involved in rescuing some people from the fire mm -hmm. uh so he was in, involved in just making sure about their welfare yes. and making sure about his own team's welfare yes. and all that kind of stuff. So much of the initial decision making was up to me. And I know in hindsight, I probably jumped into it a little too soon, but your emotions are high yes. at that stage. And all you want to do is, is repair yes. and see things back to normal. Yes. And so that there are things now that I think in hindsight I might have done a little differently. Right. Yes. But generally I'm really happy yeah. with what we've managed to achieve. Good, good. 
Excellent. Now, I mentioned the Polven fencing product. I've got a piece here in front of us. So this is for our listeners. Do you want? Can you describe what Polven fencing products are or what it is and what sure. you're for? Yes, it's basically a PVC post and rail. Um, yeah. So hard solid, isn't it? Like it's a yes. So the um, very similar to your PVC water pipes, the white ones yes. yeah. that people use as down pipes for their guttering and those kinds of things. Yeah. yeah. Um, except for this is probably thicker. Yes. Um, it's it's a it is a slightly different product because it's a little more flexible and it's also um, had s I'm assuming some additive yeah, put into put it, in. it to make it s sun resistant. Yeah. And it is quite bright white. So what I'll do is I'll I'll actually we'll put some photos on our website and things and some links to the Polven uh, website so you can sort of have a look at the uh, the product yourself. But it's it is uh, we've not used this before we've not installed anything with it before and our guys really enjoyed the work and sort of piecing it all together and learning about a new product uh, but it seems to be really quite flexible in its application um, and you'd had it before you so you we replaced what had been here before is that yeah, right yes so i had a um a polven post and rail fence around my arena yes um and that had probably been in existence for about eight years. Right. And I was really, really happy with how it went. Um, it's low maintenance. So as long, I mean, I had a couple of patches that changed colour because my bore water was hitting yes. it. Yes, yeah. Uh, so I had the orange stain yes. from Ironstone. But other than that, it was very good. There wasn't really any change in colour. Mm. So no maintenance needed? No maintenance needed. So that w that's high yeah. on my priority Absolutely. list because Absolutely. I had 100 metres of <clears throat> Preston Rail that I did not want to be no. painting every couple of years. No. And the other thing, you know, quite frankly, it really doesn't matter whether the product is plastic or wood, whether it's CCA or creosote. When you have a fire come through... It burns the light and really the pieces that we pulled out of the ground were all cut off that you would have to do the same if it was creosote or cca so yeah the, um, the good thing with the polven and they had told me this when i'd first purchased it is um it is how do you describe it it takes a lot for it to to so it has a low combust. melting point or high yeah, melting point, high right? melting yeah. point so after the fire had come through all the posts had had bent, yes, um, and the rails had all all warped. But the only ones that had physically burned and and charred more than like yeah. caught a light were ones that were near. I had some um, a timber retaining wall, oh yes, and it was the timber that caught, and then because the posts were next to it, yes, the yes. heat's been maintained and they've eventually yeah, caught right. a light. That's interesting. Yeah, no, that's good. So it's a it's a real option. For people looking to use it around their properties uh is it recycled plastic i wonder i don't i don't no, know i don't know either and I, and I feel like if it was that we'd know about it because that'd be their big selling point yeah. so maybe it's not i have a feeling they will take product old product back polven yes. will yeah and may do something yes. to recycle yep. it but it's not a product where you could pull it up and then just take it to a recycle centre. No, no, no. All right. You really used the Polven again this time because you'd had it before. Yeah. You liked what you saw and uh, and that's what you wanted. Yep. Sandy, before I let you go, uh, on our way here, we passed Five Bob Road. Now, do you know the story behind Five Bob Road? I do, but I'm going to let you tell. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I do love this. I do know. It's a bit cheeky, but I just, it tickles my, I just think it's great. So my understanding, and people may correct me, is that back in the, uh, what we like to call when we're my age, olden days, uh, there was um, a lady who lived on this road and uh, she would charge five bob to Cor any visitors that would uh, come a calling. Is that Correct. to your understanding? Yes. I think that is just a great story and, a, you know, and, and what a wonderful way to name a road. It's so much better than a lot of the other names of roads you see around the place i i think that's the way that kind every road should have a story and i think that's a great story five bob road i think it's great thank you for hosting us today sandy you're a very busy lady and you've been really generous with your time thank you you're welcome thank you for listening to the adelaide hills farmcast we hope you found it helpful and a little bit entertaining 
You can leave comments and send questions on the show notes page for this episode, which is on our website, adelaidehillsfarmservices.com.au. Just click on Farmcast and look for the June episode. Life is uncertain. It's okay to feel stressed, anxious, worried, or frustrated. It's normal. With CalHOPE's free and secure mental health resources, it's easy to get the help you and your loved ones need when you need it the most. Call our warm line at 833-317-4673 or live chat at calhope.org today. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.